So good afternoon to everybody and welcome to the Three Hair Court Autumn Employment Law webinar series. I'm going to start by introducing myself and my two colleagues and then we're going to dive into what we're going to discuss today. So my name is Sara Ibrahim. I head up the employment law group here at Three Hair Court. Um, like a lot of people in the Three Hair Court employment team, my work intersects with commercial work. So that's everything um, from high court to shareholder, uh, direct to disputes. I also do quite a bit of discrimination work uh, with a particular specialism in parties who are vulnerable. And I was reappointed to the panel of counsel for the Commission of Equalities and Human Rights. And I am listed in Legal 500 as a leading junior for employment. I'm going to take my colleagues in the order they're going to speak after me. So moving next to Catherine Bailey. Catherine Bailey has considerable experience in employment law. She's currently acting um, part-time as consultant to Withers and that means she's dealing with all sorts of matters such as breach of contract, uh, post-termination restrictions and all types of dismissal as well as partnership, shareholder disputes and the like. She does have an interest in artificial intelligence. She's previously co-written an article with me on international um, employment law and the regulatory landscape around AI. And she recently, again, co-presented uh, to the Equality and Human Rights Commission enforcement team on this topic. We then will be coming to Daniel Black, who has a commercial and employment practice. Uh, rather interestingly, he was led in the Supreme Court recently on the Pakistani International Airline case, which was the first case um, that the, the UK's Supreme Court has recognised and articulated the existence of a lawful act economic duress, but we're not going to be discussing that today. He is also very familiar with the Supreme Court decision of Uber and Aslan, and he has been doing a lot of advisory work on that so he's very well of tech companies and questions of employment status so those are my colleagues that um, are going to be assisting today and without further ado Catherine can I ask for the first slide please thank you so we're going to be breaking our uh, topics down into three so we are looking firstly at the international context. So that's the regulatory framework. And we're going to take you on a trip through what is happening in the EU, the US, China, and then India. So that's perhaps more traveling than quite a lot of us have done during this whole pandemic. We're then going to dive into what's happening in this jurisdiction um, and, and what ought to be anticipated. And thirdly, Daniel Black is going to be addressing the high profile litigation that you probably will want to know about. Before we go on to the key messages, I think one thing that has to be said about this area is it is a very exciting area where you get the intersection of ethics, law and policy. This used to be a matter where people thought it was just about tech companies, but I think you will all know that there has been a mass acceleration of the use of um, data, artificial intelligence and algorithms over this pandemic period. So this really is a timely thing to be discussing. So we're going to be having a, a look at all of those topics, but ultimately we have some very key messages that we think connects all of these things. Firstly, the scale of the challenge, the use of artificial intelligence and algorithms mean that it, it is becoming ubiquitous. By that I mean it is going across jurisdictions and it is being used by a whole raft of businesses, organisations and individuals. Secondly, we want to really touch upon accountability in the artificial um, intelligence context. And that is something that will really come out in the first segment. Thirdly, we want to look at the consequences of litigation. And we mean that more broadly because there is a clear role for, for regulators um, in this field. And arguably they may be doing some of the heavy lifting at the early stages. 
And finally, as we always try and do at Three Hair Court, we're going to talk about practical advice. So that's the important things that you can do and the legal and technical expertise you may want to be putting in place now um, to enable you uh, to be ready to go off on the front foot. Catherine, could you move to the next slide, please? So before we start on a, a deep dive in those areas, I just want to talk about a, a glossary of, of, of some of these terms here. These are terms that may be entirely familiar to some of you, but perhaps less so to others. So what kinds of terms do we think that you ought to be aware of? Well, the, the first in terms of accuracy bias, I think is important. One of the key drivers towards um, the use of AI and algorithms is this notion that humans are biased and we hope that AI is not biased. However, when you're getting um, into situations where you're using data sets, um, which may have inherent bias in them, and then you're uploading in them into these systems, that can be problematic. You are replicating and amplifying bias. We're also going to quickly touch upon algorithmic auditing. So that's a, a sense of an emerging sector of people who can actually unpick algorithms and work out the minutiae of how they are making decisions. And why is that important? Well, there's this term black box. Black box refers to either an algorithm or a machine learner. So that means that the machine learning tool can be opaque and no one can really understand, including regulators, what is going on. So the more you use uh, data-driven information systems uh, in a kind of wide variety of decision-making processes, the more this black box, box effect um, can be problematic. Now, if we're talking about a legal context, one key legal context is natural justice. So this becomes a, a problem in the context of AI because the fundamental premise of natural justice is being able to understand the basis on which a decision has been made. And with a black box, sometimes you cannot do that. And I've already referred to data inequality and the sense of data legacy based injustice. But I think before we go to that, let's just talk about digitally mediated workplaces. For those of you um, who work with tech companies already, that is going to be very familiar to you. But essentially, it is where a platform creator, usually an employer, defines and um, implements a platform, so something like TaskRabbit, um, where people are doing lots of different tasks or offering themselves up to do certain tasks. So they become the workers or employees and they kind of sign in or rely on this platform to find and obtain um, money for the jobs they do. Similarly, your end client is using that same platform to procure and pay for that labour. Uh, it, it would be remiss if I didn't mention Uber, who are perhaps one of the best known types of digital platform out there. Finally, I just want to touch upon hyper nudges. So most people are familiar with the context of a nudge. That's the, the notion that you are nudging people towards certain types of behavior. AI completely changes the nature and the scale on what, which people can do that. So it becomes very potent. And with the timeframes that we're looking at, which are far, far more truncated than normal nudges, it becomes quite dynamic and it can be very all pervasive. And that is why it is called a hyper nudge. It's basically leading to potentially dramatic and regular behavioral shifts and um, using so-called imperceptible nudges. And this has clearly worrying effect for autonomy of people. So Catherine, if you could move us to the next slide. The first place on our tour, if you like, is going to be the EU. And the EU is an interesting place to start because on the, the 21st of April, this year, the Commission has published their proposed text 
of what I'm going to refer to as AIA, the Artificial Intelligence Act. So the objective of this um, has been split broadly down into four. So that's to make sure that the Act is going to put in place or ensure AI systems that are put in place are safe um, and respect what they would consider the existing law on fund fundamental rights and EU values. Legal certainty is another objective of this. The third is to enhance governance and effective enforcement of existing law and fundamental rights. And the fourth one is the development of a single market, which is perhaps quite central to the EU's mission. One interesting thing about this is it tries to regulate and or mitigate non-material harms to citizens. But even more important than this is this all-encompassing definition of artificial intelligence. So this, without going into the, the full definition, which is on your screens, and I hope you can see, is wide enough to include all statistical approaches and use of logic and knowledge um, based systems. So it really could be capturing pretty much anything. But the main point of this draft act is that it tries to prohibit or at least target its intervention to certain types of AI. So there will be uh, AI that they deem unacceptably risky. So thinking about that hyper nudge point, the kind of AI that is going to be uh, influencing people's decisions. And then you've got high risk AI. Now, very importantly, that is going to include what most employment workers are going to be looking at. So that's employment worker management and self-employment and low or minimal risk perhaps doesn't really need to be touched upon. Now, there will inevitably um, be sanctions that are being introduced, and, and perhaps it, it's more important to skip over that and think about who it's going to, to catch. So, like a lot of EU um, regulation, it is going to apply not just to EU companies, but to third um, countries that place services with AI systems in the EU, and it is focusing on tracking data not corporations. So it's not going to be enough for you to say that your particular headquarters are not in um, the EU because that is not what they're going to be looking at. More importantly, it is the cost. So it is shifting this system if it goes through onto the people who are using the AI uh, to actually verify that their AI is in accordance with the AIA or the draft AIA. That is going to mean that you're going to have to set up if your business organization, probably a, a dedicated kind of quality management system. And the EU's own reports uh, go up at the high end to that costing over 300,000 euros on a one-off cost to establish with maintenance of around 70,000 euros every year. And this is something that the um, US Chamber of Commerce has commented on, and they think that this um, draft act could eat up as much as 17% of AI investment in Europe. But I just want to touch finally on the Brussels effect. So what is the Brussels effect? It, it's essentially um, the, the kind of view that the, the EU can use their power to regulate global markets without uh, needing to resort to international institutions or seeking other nations cooperation. And this is very important because at the moment, we're not seeing um, other re regulatory frameworks in place. So by um, having this, this draft AIA, um, the EU could be setting a global standard. And so it could really impact on the geopolitical dynamic in what I am terming very loosely a kind of regulations race. There is a fantastic group that has been set up recently called Ethics in AI, and they had a colloquium last week. There is one particular contribution I want to touch upon, and that was from Professor Adams Prazel, 
Now, he says he believes this draft act is going to both under-regulate at the European level and over-regulate individual member states. So what does that mean? Uh, that means he thinks that because of the mechanism that's being used, which is um, Article 114, which is the maximum harmonization approach, that this means that when member states want to have their own initiatives, perhaps have a higher level of protection against AI and um, algorithms, that that is going to be rendered illegal under the doctrine of supremacy of EU law. So I think that's quite interesting because it may actually render the AI uh, a slightly frozen in aspect and kind of paralyze the EU member state if this draft uh, goes in in its current format. The other comment to make that he touched upon, I think is very important, that this AIA structure kind of replicates what we would call a consumer product framework. Well, that means that the producer or user of the kind of the AI or, or algorithms has to self-certify compliance. Now, this isn't necessarily an approach that's going to work brilliantly with AI or algorithms. Um, and then we have the added problem of AIA that there isn't really a role for the consumers under that framework and they can't necessarily enforce rights or access to standards. But this is still in draft. It's anticipated that it needs to go through the various committees of the EU. So it could, in fact, change. Can I have the next slide, please? So from the EU to the US, who have been equally vocal about um, AI. And you will have seen some very interesting uh, testimony given to, to various committees um, in the US. But what exactly are they contemplating? Well, I think that there needs to be a clear distinction drawn between the EU and the US. Uh, for example, the US lacks any federal privacy legislation, and they don't currently have what I would call targeted law or regulation specifically tailored to AI activities. So it has been on the agenda for some time now. And one of the things that, that's being talked about is a potential AI Bill of Rights. And we, we had um, a statement, if you like, um, that the intention to the, the creation of a Bill of Rights was to guard against powerful technologies, including AI. And this came out of the White House's Office of Science and Technology um, policy. And one of the uh, particular points that was touched upon there was uh, whether the US should in fact consider the EU approach. And the particular individual who, who floated um, that was Lynn Parker, the director of the National AI um, Initiative at the White House. Uh, and, and again, dealing with science and technology policy. So that there is some interest, I think, in the US about what the EU have done and the scope of the GDPR, which I'm sure most of you in um, this jurisdiction will be familiar with. But I want to now really focus on the Federal Trade Commission, because I think they are doing some interesting things. Those of you who aren't familiar with the American jurisdiction, there is a particular reliance at the moment when it comes to AI and algorithms on Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Now, there have been two sets of guidance um, which have come out of the FTC, uh, the first in April 2020, so that was just after the start of the um, pandemic or lockdowns in particular, and that guidance said the use of AI tools should be transparent, explainable, fair and empirically sound while fostering accountability. That word accountability being a repeating motif for a lot of regulators. There was then the April 2021 uh, guidance. You'll probably note that the Americans have had a change of administration in, in between those two bits of guidance. 
And Rebecca Slaughter, who was the um, acting, the then acting chair of the FTC, um, was really focusing on how you could address potential bias um, in AI systems. Some of the things that Rebecca Slaughter and her colleagues at the FTC have been looking at are, for example, um, Amazon, who were using a hiring algorithm. Now, Amazon had a largely male applicant pool. And because of this, the data set skewed heavily in favor of men. And it meant that almost all of the hiring recommendations that came out of this algorithm were discriminatory against the, the women applicants. Now, I really like how Rebecca Slaughter refers to this. She, she puts it kind of colloquially, garbage in, garbage out. So if you've got bad data, then you tend to get a bad result. And I think that's a really important way of looking at algorithms. They cannot solve a problem if they are not properly uh, fine tuned. There's another interesting um, example that the FTC is looking at, and that's biometric bias, which I know my colleagues, um, Catherine and Daniel will be looking at. And one of these examples was the iPhone face ID feature was found to be biased in around 2017 because it couldn't distinguish between Chinese faces. I'll just touch very briefly upon the fact that there is a potential algorithmic accountability act and a no biometric barriers um, act. But despite the fact there has been a lot of discussion about regulation in the US that hasn't quite come to fruition. But I think the interest and the urgency that the FTC is bringing to this means it is quite likely that US regulation should be expected. Finally, I think it's very interesting on this point that Facebook and particularly um, Nick Clegg, who of course is a UK export to the US, has been doing a, a tour, for want of a better word, calling on governments to regulate. So you're in a system where uh, the tech sector are actually saying you need to step up and to regulate us because the kinds of questions being thrown up about um, ethics in AI and society and how it interacts with AI essentially shouldn't be one uh, that rests with businesses. Catherine, can I have the next slide, please? I'm going to adopt a slightly lighter touch um, with India and China, because just talking about um, the international context could take a whole webinar in of itself. But essentially the focus in India is interesting because there is an education theme that runs through it rather than a hard regulation theme. And I would just put this point out at this stage, are we starting to see a fragmented national approach to AI with certain countries offering various different internets and different approaches? Now you have um, the, the various uh, points on that uh, slide in front of you, but I think one of the, the, the most interesting is the penultimate bullet point, which is responsible AI for youth. And I think India, because of its uh, dependence on the tech sector, is, is wanting to make sure that their future workers and users are going to be able to be at the forefront of um, what they are calling the AI for all initiative. But before we leave this slide, I just want to touch on the responsible AI for all approach document. And um, it's interesting that it talks there about how in that document, it is grounded in the Indian legal and regulatory context. But just to, to point out that India at the moment doesn't in fact have overarching legislation specific to AI. So th there is perhaps some development there that needs to happen. Catherine, if I could have the next slide, please. So I, I think it would be remiss not to mention China. The kinds of jurisdictions I've mentioned so far, namely um, the EU and the US and India, are all democracies. China, as we know, operates slightly differently from that, and that means it is uh, influencing their approach. That being said, some of the language to those who are looking at these documents is going to sound um, very familiar. 
for example, with the, the stated aims, talking about things such as providing ethical guidelines for natural legal persons and other related organizations and an assurance from the Chinese government has been provided, uh, perhaps to be taken with a pinch of salt, that they have in fact consulted um, with all stakeholders. But I think it has to be accepted the kind of stakeholder engagement is going to be somewhat different from that which I will be touching upon later that has happened in this jurisdiction. Catherine, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So finally, on our international whistle stop tour, I just wanted to mention the supranational bodies. So that's uh, predominantly the UN, the ILO and the OECD. Well, the UN have been approaching things primarily through what I would call um, the existing lens of human rights or fundamental rights, as they're sometimes called, privacy um, and the like. So we have a special rapporteur on the right to, to privacy, um, who's been producing reports in two last year, and they have been specifically looking at the use of data in healthcare contexts. And I'm sure you appreciate because of the pandemic, the need for kind of commercial entities to cooperate with governments and to get at data has slightly changed the game. There is also um, development of how uh, AI interacts with the right to freedom of opinion and expressions. But I want to move on to the ILO because I think their approach has been um, interesting in that it has developed. Uh, to put it very simply, the approach of uh, the ILO and the people was the notion that AI is replacing workers or you know the robots are coming for your jobs. Now that the narrative is so much more around whether AI can be said to exploit or exacerbate the pre-existing power imbalances between employer and employee and that is something that employment lawyers will feel far more um, familiar with. What uh, is at the very heart of this particular area of law in terms of employment law, how do you mitigate between the employer's power and the employee's relative lack of power. Now before I hand over to Catherine Bailey to take us back to um, the jurisdiction of England and Wales, I just wanted to mention the OECD and the OECD does mention that it wants human-centred and democratic values to be important. And I think this is quite key because artificial intelligence and the enthusiasm for certain governments of it is, its potential to achieve things has meant that some regulatory approaches have thus far ignored um, people and how they interact with it. But after what I, I hope is um, a relatively thorough uh, tour of what's going on internationally, I'm going to hand over to Catherine Bailey um, to take us back to the national context. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, yes, we're, we're back in um, Drizzly, Britain, I'm afraid, England and Wales more specifically, um, after that um, international whistle-stop tour. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the national context, um, the first two of these next four slides. Um, and we thought it would be helpful to start with um, the UK government's national AI strategy. Uh, this is a recent and relatively extensive document that was published in September um, 2021, so of this year. Um, and in it, um, the government states that it has five particular aims in relation uh, to the approach to art artificial intelligence. Um, it is worth just um, recounting those um, in brief. They are, one, discovering and developing transformative AI technologies. Perhaps unsurprising that one. Two, maximizing the creativity and adventure of researchers and innovators. Three, building new research and innovation capacity to deliver the ideas, technology, and workforce for the future. Four is connecting the U UK AI research and innovation ecosystem. And five is supporting the UK's AI sector and the adoption of AI. 
Now, in particular, we want to just focus in, um, in on um, points four and five, because um, looking at this government strategy document, it's very clear that the UK government is um, essentially positioning itself so that there's a strong emphasis on encouraging innovation in the private sector. That seems to be the emphasis of this document on stated aim number four. And then in relation to stated aim number five, there's a supplementary focus on kind of a cross-pollination, if we can call it that, between that private innovation into the public sector. So the national strategy speaks um, regularly of this collaborative effort between public and private entities um, in terms of deploying artificial intelligence. Um, the second kind of sub bullet point there um, in relation to the strategy is that this particular document um, appears to place quite a considerable emphasis on deployment of artificial intelligence where there is little to no human oversight. Um, this is interesting if we compare it to the approach, for example, in the States, where there seems to be strong emphasis on making sure that even if we deploy algorithmic technology, there has to be a human somewhere involved in the decision making process. The UK government doesn't seem to be placing quite the same um, emphasis on that. Um, and it may be of note that um, the Chartered Institute of IT has recently um, suggested that they think this is a, is a bad strategic decision from the government and that the intervention of some type of human decision maker um, is incredibly important. Um, the, the next bullet point post Brexit, this is this is more of a kind of food for thought um, and ties into really something that, that Sara said at the beginning of this presentation which is that um, this topic intersects um, legal, ethical and, and policy considerations. And there's also a strong geopolitical narrative that's going on in the background here. And, and just for food for thought, we thought it would be worth flagging that in the kind of post-Brexit world where perhaps um, uh, this government thinks that it can flex its um, statutory muscles with more freedom perhaps than it had beforehand or its legislative muscles, I should say. Um, maybe artificial intelligence is the sector in which Britain um, attempts to forge ahead um, and creates a dynamic and bespoke regulatory product. Um, it will be interesting to see if that is what happens and if we take our freedom from, from the grips of the uh, EU um, and we use this as an opportunity to, to do that, to innovate in new regulatory ways. Um, the third uh, bullet point here, strategic uh, interventions with um, what must be a rhetorical question mark there. Um, there are, again, we've just set down here some of what we think could be the kind of um, uh, movers and shakers in this area. Um, the, the first bullet point, um, this is about something I was gesturing to earlier, this public-private overlap. Um, we're seeing it being deployed um, in the uh, national strategy. But in particular, we think that if we're in a situation where public entities are deploying private um, innovations or private um, AI interventions, then there's a potential gap here in terms of transparency. So there may be a hurdle being raised here for someone who's seeking to um, exercise their rights um, against a public body. If that public body turns around and says, well, look, it's not our, it's not our technology. Um, we've used this private innovator over here. So we just thought we'd flag that as a potential issue that we might see playing out um, in this area. Um, second bullet point here, the public sector equality duty. Um, again, this has been um, cropping up on the radar quite regularly, um, particularly obviously in the public sector. Um, so by way of example, the Centre for, De for Data Ethics um, and Innovation, which is a kind of um, sub-department of the uh, Departure for Digital Culture and Media, they've, re they've reported um, on the fact that they believe that it should be a general public sector duty um, to essentially um, audit um, and analyze algorithmic technology. Um, tying back into some of the glossary of terms that Sarah was discussing earlier, we could find that there are embedded data biases um, and as such, if a public entity um, wants to use or deploy algorithmic technology, um, then this report suggested that there's in fact a legal obligation as by virtue of the public sector equality duty, um, that they do that, that they audit their algorithms and they attempt to gain some transparency over the data sets um, that they're using. Uh, we've also here nodded to the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Again, we think that um, this particular um, entity is going to be an important mover and shaker um, in this context, um, in particular as it relates to, to employment. Um, artificial intelligence is part of the EHRC's um, strategic plan for 2022. 
Um, we think that it's highly likely um, that there'll be a bespoke and fit for purpose unit um, in the EHRC in due course, um, meaning that they can make use of um, their statutory and powers um, to strategically intervene um, where they see fit. Of course, they have statutory powers under the Equality Act um, 2006, um, which include under Section 20, conducting investigations. Um, we also think that there could be scope in particular for the Section 23 power here, and um, that's reaching agreements with particular um, uh, public bodies. So, for example, perhaps the EHRC would intervene on the basis that um, a body is required to create a kind of risk framework um, or to um, implement changes to the way in which they use artificial intelligence, um, perhaps to mitigate the impact, um, the potential um, inequalities or perpetuation of existing um, data bias, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then finally, here, a gesture towards um, the ICO. Um, the ICO has actually published guidance on lawfulness, fairness, and transparency um, in the deployment of AI systems. Um, just a few observations. Um, interestingly, the document doesn't define artificial intelligence, so it will be interesting to see how and to what extent um, that gap is, is corrected or if it's left um, to create uh, perhaps some space for the definition to develop over time. Um, but the document seems particularly important because it essentially suggests that um, incorrect predictions, incorrect um, inputs, can give rise to discriminatory outcomes. And this is an ICO document. So what we're looking at therefore is the potential risk for um, employers and other entities um, to, to be targeted both by potential strategic litigation. So that could be from um, private individuals, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, but also regulatory action as well um, from the ICO. Um, right, I have the slide, so I don't need to redirect myself here. Um, second slide here in relation to the national context. I can take this relatively quickly. Um, this is really just part of um, contextualizing artificial intelligence in this jurisdiction uh, within the existing legal frameworks that we have. So obviously, um, and, and again, this ties into something that Sarah was saying earlier, um, the European Draft Act really seeks to emphasize the importance of um, human rights, the inalienable rights that citizens have. Um, so the human rights context is clearly very important. Uh, we've listed there um, some of the, um, the human rights that are likely to be engaged um, when artificial intelligence is deployed. Um, the Equality Act, um, again, as domestic legislation is incredibly important. Um, and I should say that we will be um, providing some practical examples about how and to what extent we think that um, these legal frameworks will be engaged um, in the specific employment context. Um, but I've identified there um, four potential causes of action, which are obviously capable of being run in conjunction or exclusive to each other. And then finally, there's obviously a strong framework here, a strong emphasis here for um, uh, the UK GDPR um, and, and other data rights in relation to fair processing, proportionality, um, and the other important principles um, that are underpinned there. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll um, hand back over to Sarah. Thank you very much, Catherine. So when we were preparing for this particular topic, uh, we didn't realize the amount of churn there would be. And part of that has been the APPG for Future Work came out with a report last week following their evidence gathering in May or June this year. So this suggests this part of a, a new path that this country can take, partially um, because we have departed from the EU. So what does the uh, creativity perhaps allow for? Well, a new act, the artificial intelligence um, at work or accountability for algorithms act, AAA. Now this comes because they in essence accepted the evidence of Helen Mountfield QC. That is the current framework we have in the UK, uh, best expressed as a tripartite one, human rights, the Equality Act and privacy doesn't deal adequately with the challenge posed by AI. Now Helen Mountfield QC said, in general, the Equality Act does not impose any obligations or employers or, or software designers. 
or anyone else to think about or avoid discrimination and disadvantage as a proactive duty. She went on to say, if we don't design the future we want, the future will be designed by accident. So how do we design the future we want? Well, according to the APPG, we should have an act and the act should be um, an accountability for algorithms act. Now, one of the things that you will note that it is a repeating theme is that of transparency. So when uh, people are thinking about new regulation and statutes, they want to ensure that we understand what the AI and algorithms are. It's not going to be enough uh, for companies, businesses, organisations to say, I didn't do it, the algorithm did it, or the robots did it. It has to be explainable. And this means you'll need independent evaluation. So we are anticipating as a, a team here at, at Three Hair Court that there are, are going to have to be uh, times where you're going to have to source skills from other organisations to make sure you have the, the, the appropriate people to scrutinise. There's also uh, a priority on updating uh, digital protection. And a lot of this is to attract the, the new class of workers people are thinking about who've been termed digital natives. And, and, and this partially overlaps with what the Portuguese have done um, in, I think this month, where they have given you the right to disconnect, which I'm sure all, all lawyers would quite welcome. Third, there is an enabling a partnership approach. And this is quite interesting coming out of an APPG. Why? This is a cross-party um, body. And the cross-party um, body are suggesting that there is funding for the TUC's um, AI working group. Now, the TUC have been doing a significant amount um, to research how you get a sync up between the interests of workers and those programs which employers are quite keen to roll out, which are going to be monitoring them and perhaps recruiting new colleagues. Now, I just want to touch on enforcement because at the moment, I think there's a little known um, government forum called the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum. Now, presently, the ICO, the Competition and Markets Authority and Ofcom are members of this, but the EHRC is not a member of this. Now, given one of the key um, ramifications of um, ill used AI or algorithms is discrimination. It is quite key um, that the Commission is um, enveloped into this body and that is part of the recommendation that the APPG have come up with. They've also uh, suggested what they call um, the Work 5.0 strategy. Now this basically uh, comes down to correcting an omission in the government's AI strategy. The government's AI strategy doesn't really pay attention to um, the human beings uh, who are meant to be interacting with it. So it is putting people back at the centre of this debate. And, and finally, just to touch on the Good Work Charter, I know quite a few attendees here will be very familiar with it and its 10 principles, including access, fair pay, conditions, equality, dignity, autonomy, which I think is going to be very important, as well as well-being, support, participation and learning. Catherine, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Now, I, I'm not going to steal my colleague Daniel Black's thunder too much because you'll be aware that on, on top of the APPG reporting last week, the Supreme Court finally handed down the decision in Lloyd versus Google, which talks about group litigation orders. And the, the reason we are flagging those is because when you have any AI or algorithm, it is usually doing something at its scale. So does this create a new class of claimants and does it mean financial risk to the organisations and businesses that use them is quite significant. As I said, I will not trespass um, on, on what my colleague is going to say. But I also just want to, to flag that when you get regulatory action, it should be anticipated that that may lead to kind of parasitic consumer 
um, actions and litigation. So, for example, after the ICO issuing Facebook with a penalty uh, for its maximum amount of half a million, uh, there was a claim, a consumer representative action, which was launched um, earlier this year. Obviously, we are, we're still to hear what will happen. We then have the role of NGOs. We've already seen, for example, Liberty interve intervening in legal challenges, particularly the case of um, Bridges and uh, the Chief Constable of South Wales. Again, a matter I know my colleague Daniel Black will be looking at. Trade unions have shown that they are quite happy to deploy their fighting funds. And ACAS, for those employment lawyers who, who wondered when ACAS would be mentioned, they have um, produced their recommendations about um, algorithmic approaches in the employment context. And they, rather contrary to what the government has said, think there should always be a human manager who has final responsibility for workplace decisions. It's an interesting document and I would encourage you to read it. Catherine. Thanks, Sarah. Right, so AI in the world of work, we are deploying all of that context now and applying it to the specific employment scenario. Um, first of all, some common contexts in which we're seeing the deployment of artificial intelligence um, in the world of work. Um, they're listed there. Um, we're seeing in particular, um, and this is something that Sarah has touched on earlier, that in the wake of the pandemic and remote working, there's been an unprecedented acceleration in digitization. Um, employers are therefore looking um, at deploying more invasive and um, more technologically advanced um, techniques and interventions um, in the working processes. Um, that ties into remote working. So um, by way of example, um, you, we might expect to see um, certain types of um, algorithms that track um, employee activity. That could be mouse clicks. It could be the period of time between sending and exchange, uh, uh, between receiving and sending emails. Um, that kind of thing, tracking the data that relates to employee activities um, in what is an essentially intrusive way. Um, another example, although strictly not within the world of work. Um, it's close to home and it doesn't take much imagination to see how it could be deployed in the world of work. Um, there was a recent um, furore about um, the use of um, facial recognition technology um, when uh, pupils were sitting the bar exams during the summer of 2020. So um, as a result of COVID, the pupils were, were taking their exams remotely from, from their homes or other private places. And um, bar course providers uh, were encouraging students um, to use artificial um, intelligence, um, facial recognition technology, to ensure that the student sitting the exam was the person that it was supposed to be. Now, one of the very well documented problems with facial recognition um, is that it does a particularly bad job at correctly identifying the faces of black and minority ethnic people. So it was, obviously, um, it was obviously identified early on um, that if this was the technology um, that bar school providers were, were going to deploy, then it would be potentially discriminatory. Um, it would put potential categories of um, bar school students at disadvantage in the sense that it could create technical difficulties because of a failure to correctly identify the face of the student system in the exam. So um, this was just a, a high profile um, a high profile report that came up on the radars of, of many lawyers at the time. Um, but one can see how that kind of intervention could quite easily be deployed in the context of work and how there could be these unintended, um, but nevertheless discriminatory contexts, uh, consequences, sorry, um, of deploying uh, particular types of um, artificial interventions. Um, the second bullet point I should, um, I think I want to um, have a quick look at is um, the people analytics um, point. Um, this may be a term that's familiar um, to um, the majority of the people tuning in today, um, but for those who haven't heard the phrase before, um, in essence, it means um, using statistical tools or um, uh, big data to um, measure, report and understand employee performance and also employee sentiment. 
So um, as part of this people analytics package that's being offered by certain um, very well-known um, consultancy firms and other big tech companies, there's both um, one side of things is optimizing employee performance. And the other side of things is um, obtaining a better insight into employee sentiment. Um, and in part of that latter intervention, um, there's a thing called pulse surveys. So this is um, the use of technology to try and track um, employee levels of um, contentment, if there are problems in the workforce, so on and so forth. So it's both analyzing um, employee output, but also to a certain extent, employee emotions. So we can begin to get an insight therefore into how potentially intrusive the deployment of people analytics can be. Um, one example of the way people analytics works um, might be to um, monitor, as I mentioned earlier, the number of emails or calls that a particular employee um, takes um, in a certain time frame. Um, it might track the timestamps or the time differences between um, the receipt of information or, or work and uh, the turnaround time. And, and looking at that from an employment law perspective, we can see that there are potentially a multitude of problems with that. But using one particular example, if you have an employee who is perhaps working from home as a result of COVID-19 and has um, childcare responsibilities or perhaps young people living in the home with them, then it's more than possible that the people analytics data that will be um, produced in relation to that particular employee may look statistically less productive than other employees. So for example, more time may be spent between receiving um, calls or responding to emails and so on and so forth, and query whether that would be a discriminatory deployment of um, artificial intelligence if there were potential uh, negative outcomes for those employees. Would those employees be suffering a detriment as a result of a, of a discriminatory um, algorithmic um, intervention? Um, so those were kind of abstracted ideas. There are two concrete examples that we want to touch on. Um, the first one relates to um, the very well-known multinational Unilever. Unilever was using a, um, an artificial intelligence product called HireVue um, as part of its recruitment, recruitment process uh, for its internationally renowned um, future leadership program. Um, I believe Unilever interviewed something like um, a quarter of a million applicants uh, for um, 800 positions. And previously, this took Unilever between four to six months. Uh, not so after Harview was deployed, because what Harview did um, was it used a combination of facial recognition and speech detection um, uh, artificial intelligence to um, rate and rank um, candidates as part of the recruitment process. The problem, or we say a problem with inverted commas here, um, with this high view intervention um, is that it had the capacity to be um, discriminatory. For example, um, women and men are, to take those two um, um, as an example, socialize differently and use different language. So if Harview was allocating, let's say, a points-based system to the use of particular types of language um, that demonstrated, for example, confidence, um, then it was potentially resulting in discriminatory outcomes in relation to the recruitment process uh, because um, men were being prioritized over women applicants. Um, another example um, in the banking um, sector, um, we, we, we note in particular that this perhaps touches on um, what Sara identified as the earlier focus of the ILO, which is the replacement of, um, of employees um, with um, artificial intelligence um, techniques or technologies. So for example, um, JP Morgan Chase, um, they've had an eye-wateringly enormous um, budget for um, the deployment of artificial intelligence. Um, and they've been hired th uh, 53,000 technologists to essentially speed up um, the processes at the bank. Um, and these have included um, a particular focus on cost saving um, and revenue enhancement. So we can see there the scope for the deployment of artificial intelligence essentially um, uh, taking over certain employees' jobs um, and so on. Um, the final slide here in relation to um, artificial intelligence in the world of work, we're looking at some more worked examples here. So touching on um, unfair dismissal and how this might interact um, with artificial intelligence. Um, 
it's possible that um, there could be a challenge um, to a dismissal, dismissal decision based on um, an employer using an algorithm or a machine learning tool um, to reach a conclusion um, in relation to whether or not to dismiss an employee. Um, as we've um, identified earlier, there's a possibility that as um, artificial intelligence is, is um, developed and deployed in the UK, there'll be limited human oversight over these processes. So this raises questions about the legal tests that set out in Section 98. Um, how far um, can one say that a decision made by a machine um, is a reasonable one? It will be interesting to see um, how and to what extent um, unfair dismissal um, uh, could be a new um, a, a prominent cause of action in relation to um, artificial intelligence um, in the world of work. Um, touching on what Sarah mentioned earlier, we think in, in relation to mitigating the risks for employers in particular, um, this really demonstrates the importance of transparency and of cracking open that black box, as it were, um, and attempting, if one can at all, to audit one's algorithms and to identify and understand how and why they work. Workplace discrimination, obviously, this ties into what I said earlier. We've already touched on how various um, artificial intelligence interventions could be discriminatory. Um, again, um, GDPR, how this intersects with this area. Um, for example, uh, pursuant to Article 5.1d uh, of the UK GDPR, there's an obligation that data that is processed must be accurate. So in circumstances where there are question marks over the um, initial accuracy or um, the absence of bias in the original data sets, um, query whether the GDPR um, uh, obligations are at play here and are capable of being breached. If they are in an employment context, this creates some difficulties because obviously employees cannot um, base claims in the tribunals in relation to breach of GDPR. So um, there's arguably a lacuna there in the frameworks and the existing legal frameworks. Um, and then finally, um, just to tie back into the human rights context here, um, and also um, the way that uh, the world of work looks now after COVID, the gradual erosion of the work and private life here. Um, are we looking at potential engagement of Article 8? Um, are we looking at contexts in which employee, employees are essentially being monitored um, by their employers? And if so, um, are there human rights engaged? And, and is that intervention proportionate in the circumstances? Um, so that really wraps up my component here. Um, I believe we have um, Daniel Black waiting in the wings to come in and I will um, go to the final slide. Good afternoon, everyone. As you heard the opening from uh, Sarah, our final area is high profile cases, uh, lessons we can learn and, and issues uh, that we can anticipate. Uh, these are uh, Lloyd and Google, um, the recent Supreme Court decision. Uh, another decision known as JK and MK, and this is on our legal services uh, regulations. And in my view, it indicates that we are currently in a position where AI could lawfully draft statements of case. Uh, and, and that raises considerable implications with respect to what are normally the uh, ethical and regulatory uh, rules which control the drafting of uh, statements of case and the conduct of litigation. Uh, and the third area is, is the advance of, of technology in causing litigation generally. So the key issue in, in Lloyd uh, is whether the claimant, Mr Richard Lloyd, um, could bring a claim against Google uh, in a representative capacity. Uh, the claim was in respect of compensation under Section 13 of the Data Protection Act 1998, and its basis was for damage allegedly suffered by a class of Apple iPhone users uh, as a result of unlawful processing by Google of their personal data in breach of the Act's requirements. In essence, uh, for several months in late 2011 and early 2012, it appears Google secret secretly tracked the internet activity of some 4 million of Apple's iPhone users in England and Wales. This data was collected without their knowledge and without their consent for commercial advertising purposes. Now, in English law, as is well known, class actions are rare. Um, but CPR 19 does provide a mechanism for a cause of actions, a cause of action rather, where parties have the same interest. 
and, and it provides that where, the, where more than one person has the same interest in a claim, that claim may be begun or the court may order that the claim be continued by or against one or more of the persons who have the same interest as the representatives of any parties who have that interest. Now, this is where the claimant's allegations were of potentially profound consequence. Their essence was that the same interest requirement test uh, was satisfied in this claim on the basis that there were a uniform class of persons who could recover a uniform sum of damages for breaches. And here's the kicker, that is without having to investigate their individual circumstances. Now, £750 was the claimant's suggested loss, which is relatively meagre. But when you tot up those sums, the claim reached the figure of £3 billion. Now, because Google was and is a corporation based in Delaware, the, court, the claimant needed the court's permission to serve outside of the jurisdiction. Now, Google opposed the application on a couple of grounds, but one of which was that the claim was not suitable uh, to proceed as a representative action. Before the High Court, it had been decided in Google's favour. The Court of Appeal reversed that decision. The Supreme Court then intervened, uh, and it was led by Lord Leggett. Now, there's a distinction between what the Supreme Court felt generally, uh, as a matter of principle, and the outcome which was arrived at in the case. So Lord Leggett felt that class actions are a flexible tool of convenience in the administration of justice and observed that a broad and adaptable approach had been adopted by the highest courts in Australia, Canada and New Zealand to their use. Now, it was reasoned by Lord Leggett that this was even more appropriate in the modern era with the development of digital technologies, which greatly increase the potential for mass harm and for which legal redress may be sought. Lord Leggett felt that the same interest test must be interpreted purposively and pragmatically in light of its rationale and the overriding objective of the CPR to deal with cases justly. Further, it was not a bar to a representative claim that a represented person had a separate cause of action, nor that the relief claimed consisted of damages. Damages, it was found, could be claimed in a representative action if they could be calculated on a basis common to all persons represented. Now, Lord Leggett rejected the claimant's case for two reasons. Uh, the first was that se a Section 13 claim under the Data Protection Act uh, required material damage, and this did not include the sort of processing that happened to the data of Mr. Lloyd. Uh, and secondly, it was held that in order to recover, it was necessary to prove what the unlawful processing by Google of personal data was. And that did in fact have to be proven in relation to a specific individual. Now, for our purposes today, it's the class action avenue. Uh, and, and that is what AI is going to force our institutions to grapple with. Uh, and while the Supreme Court um, was inclined to assert the potential utility of representative actions in mass data right violation claims, it was inclined to do so only if the circumstances were appropriate. But it's not clear, at least from the judgment it isn't clear, um, what those circumstances are. Now, given that, it seems unlikely, it seems we can draw from Google that it's unlikely that a representative action is going to be a fruitful mechanism for group uh, data claims, at least as is conceived of in the way CPR 19.6 is currently drafted. Another implication is that in the end it may be, and it may only be subject to parliamentary legislation, that there is a future here in factory style claims. Uh, if one thinks of a very different field, uh, that of flight delay claims for compensation for flights which are either cancelled or delayed, what often happens is that a claim will be brought by one claimant in respect of a single flight, and if they win, a collection of individual actions based on the same flight uh, are issued. These tend to be issued on very basic claim forms with very brief particulars of claim. Uh, 
that, of course, is an example of representative uh, litigation rather than group litigation. But in reality, in a business sense, these, ca these cases are often uh, managed together. This brings us to how such mass actions might be made most profitable uh, and whether AI can draft statements of case. So that's the second case, um, JK and MK. Now, I got thinking about this because I'd recently been approached to consider whether AI could lawfully be used to draft statements of case. Now, the case itself, strictly speaking, concerned algorithms rather than AI, some older technology, as we're all aware. And what happened is a company called Amicable offered would-be litigants in person, and that's important, a service whereby if the individuals typed essential information into online systems, one of the company's algorithms would automatically produce for them necessary court documents. These would then be checked by an individual employee, and this individual employee would not be a lawyer. It would essentially be an administrative check. However, the issue was that if the human checker was engaged in the reserved legal activity where they had prepared a document for use in legal proceedings, then the individuals would not be litigants in person anymore and the company would be committing an offence. Now, Mostyn J held that an unqualified person, the human checker, will not have prepared a document for use in legal proceedings unless they were a major contributor to the drafting and filed the document with the court. But then in a remark which is tantalizingly brief, um, the judge goes on to say, I consider the human factor plainly means that the member of staff in question has prepared to some extent the document. However, it will not be long, surely, before artificial intelligence will do the checking. When that day arrives, and it will not be far away, it could not be said that anybody has prepared the documents. This strikes me as really significant stuff because what that passage suggests, given AI's greatly strengthened capabilities compared to algorithms, and what the UK's Legal Services Act of 2007 appears to countenance, is that AI is not a legal person. And because AI is not a legal person, then it's utterly unregulated by the Legal Services Act. Now, the act may be outdated, this review of evidence ended in 2004, but that doesn't change the reality we face that there's a potential problem coming down the tracks. There may, of course, be purposive and clever ways around this. It, it may be found that the firm or the company which was using AI itself had to be regulated in place of the AI. But right now, that is just not clear. Right now, the Legal Services Act appears not to touch AI and not to regulate what it can do in conducting litigation or preparing documents for court, because the Act simply never countenanced it. The significance is obvious because AI's ability to be commercially adventitious is plain. That takes us then to our final area, uh, and it is big brother facial recognition um, issues that we've touched on before. So we know that collecting equality information can be done lawfully under our data protection law and our data protection regime. The law doesn't prevent public authorities from processing personal data, so long as it's for the purposes of general or specific duties. Uh, so the case of Edward Bridges, uh, that's 2020, uh, England and Wales Court of Appeal, uh, Civil 1058, was one such case. The claimant alleged that South Wales' police force um, had failed to consider the possibility that automated facial recognition technology might produce indirectly discriminatory results because it may produce a higher rate of false positives for female and minority groups, and that this would be breaching the public sector equality duty. The High Court had found the current legal framework to be adequate, 
but it had warned in almost the next breath that it would have to be subject to periodic review. The Court of Appeal, however, disagreed and did not consider that the provision for a human reviewer was sufficient to just discharge the equality duty. Now, the judgment means that the police force that was leading the use of facial recognition on UK streets has to halt a long running trial. The Court of Appeal held there were fundamental deficiencies in the legal framework and that Ed Bridges' rights were breached as a result and further ruled that the South Wales Police had never sought to satisfy themselves, either directly or by way of independent verification, that the software program in this case does not have an unacceptable bias, bias rather, on the grounds of race or sex. Now, this is of course a growing topic uh, and it's one which looks certain to bring more litigation by its very nature. If we think, for example, of the regulatory objectives for legal services, uh, and they uh, follow from the 2007 Act we were just discussing. They involve protecting and promoting the public interest and encouraging an independent, strong, diverse, and effective legal profession. Now, AI at least potentially threatens these as it threatens so many of the potential ethical obligations um, that are in play. Now, during the recent passage of the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Act of 2020, the US Congress, uh, which by virtue of its military prowess and AI's battlefield possibilities, is likely to be at the forefront of nascent AI legal personality issues, issued a joint statement of congressional intent of the Senate and the House of Representatives, which included the following passage. The, conferen the conferees believe that artificial intelligence systems have the potential to transfer, transform rather, every sector of the United States. So far, so good. But the report goes on to say that the conferees further believe that harmful artificial intelligence systems may include artificial intelligence systems that unlawfully discriminate against protected classes of persons, including on the basis of sex, race, age, disability, etc. Now, back on home shores, you may have seen that fresh claims have emerged after Uber introduced an automated system to check the ID of drivers operating its services last April. This system operated in that each time a driver checked in for work, it would have to take a selfie picture, which would be compared by an automated system to one on their Uber account. Now, Padre Samanjang, who worked for the Uber Eats takeaway courier service, has launched an employment tribunal claim alleging that his account was illegally deactivated. His claim is that the automa automated facial verification software wrongly decided that his pictures were of someone else on several occasions. His case is that this ultimately led to his removal as a driver. Um, and it was these continued mismatches, the technology getting it wrong, that is why he lost the position. He had suggested that Uber ask a human being to review photos, but was told um, after careful consideration, uh, that was the quote used by Uber, his account was to be deactivated. No further information was provided about the nature of the review in his case. That again ties back to the applicable pr principles for legal services and their regulatory objectives, one of which is the upholding of natural justice. So here then is perhaps a good place for a final word. AI presents opportunities, but those opportunities are for losses as well as gains, and both need to be thought about and insulated against. The risk of bias, racism and other great ills is real, Yet it is also real that AI's likely commercial implications will make us use it in litigation and will make its use in litigation too tempting to ignore. That then is all the more reason to grapple with its ethical and practical implications to make sure we as lawyers keep our guard up and to follow this developing case law closely. And with that, I'll pass back over 
to say. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you very much to our participants because of our enthusiasm for this area. We've slightly run over, but I take most of the fault for that because I did most of the talking. I note that we haven't had any questions in the chat. Uh, maybe we've completely bamboozled you um, with so much law and so much analysis. So I am going to take the opportunity to ask my colleagues a quick question. So that's to Daniel and Catherine. And that's in this current employment context we have, where a lot of um, employees and workers will be saying, we've had to deal with furlough, we've had to deal with remote working. There are questions perhaps of, you know, fraud on the government schemes, potential discrimination, redundancies. Do we really need to be thinking about AI at the moment? Can we put it on the back burner? What, what would you say to them, Daniel and Catherine? History comes at you fast, <laughs> uh, and, and unfortunately, it is just an area that's going to have to be thought about and, and mm -hmm. grapple with quickly the both the scale um, of AI's potential consequences and, and its pace of its change uh, are, are going to bring this more to the forefront. We just mentioned the Google mm -hmm. um, case there, the Uber case there, mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately the safer commercial decision long term is to get one's house in order on this now because that's going to reduce potential future liabilities which can possibly arise. Catherine did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah I just wanted to supplement that by just saying that I think tying into one of those key messages at the beginning of the presentation um, accountability and transparency are so important and if we're talking about how employers can obtain employee buy-in, let's say, to the deployment of artificial intelligence in the workplace, then I think accountability and transparency will be so important um, as part of that. So employers need to be conscious that, for example, um, perhaps in the wake of COVID where there have been um, COVID vaccination policies or mask wearing policies, Consultation with employees really assists in smoothing over the introduction of potentially intrusive um, um, systems in the workplace. Um, consultation, accountability, and transparency, I think, will will assist in trying to trying to make the deployment of AR as commercially and legally um, safe as possible. Mm -hmm. Catherine, I, I think that's an excellent point to end on, particularly as I recognize a lot of attendees and I, I know that they've got our personal emails so if they do have questions you are more than welcome any of you who've listened in to drop us an email or to, to drop an email to marketing at threehaircourt.com for those of you who have colleagues who haven't been able to attend this is going to be uploaded on to our youtube channel so they can watch it and indeed if you want to you can re-watch it and there's some other great content on there from my other colleagues so all uh, it leaves me to do is to say thank you very much to Catherine Bailey and Daniel Black uh, for their contributions and I hope you enjoyed this webinar as much as I did. Many thanks everybody.